Good morning, Changemakers. Welcome to the second week of the Environmental Changemaker series brought to you by Environmental Scouts. You are no doubt joining us to hear from three incredible youth leaders from heirs to our oceans. I am Adriana Glazner, co-founder of Environmental Scouts. I'm a mom and education consultant, and today, like most days, I'm a proud teacher. Environmental Scouts is the vision of one of my students. With the help of her parents, Brooke's idea for an environmental club for kids quickly grew into an opportunity to connect individual change makers and nonprofit organizations to share their educational resources for an amplified impact. Our series is our first labor of love to help achieve that goal. We want each of you to see that you're part of a coalition of partners worldwide, whether it be nonprofits, youth change makers, youth clubs, or individual kids and adults who are ready to be the change. There are so many groups and individuals already doing that work. There are fantastic materials and initiatives just waiting to be discovered. So we proudly bring you the Environmental Changemaker series to amplify those voices and to help you find yours. So whether your cause is wildlife conservation, community gardening, plastic pollution, climate change, or something yet unknown, the earth needs you. Please like this video and subscribe below. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook at Environmental Scouts and we're on Instagram at Enviro Scouts LA. So now I'm proud to present to you a couple of special guests. We have Brooke, our co-founder and young activist from Environmental Scouts. Good morning, Brooke. Good morning, I'm so happy to be here. Great, I'm so glad to see you as always. Um, Brooke, today we have three really special guests. We have youth leaders from Heirs to Our Ocean. I'm going to just give a brief introduction to what Heirs to Our Ocean is so that you can have a better perspective of who these wonderful young people are. So Heirs to Our Ocean has a lot of goals that they're going to tell you more about. But essentially, we're looking at long-term investment in our youth through education, empowerment, and connection opportunities. This is an organization that has approached conservation this way for over 50 years to help their natural environment from continued deterioration. So this episode is so special because it's all about investment in our youth and that's something that we value also. Right Brooke? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. With us today we have Latifa, Rita, and Sarah. Hi ladies. Hi. Thank you. It's for so good to see you. Hi. <laughs> Good morning or good evening for some of you. So let's see, we have Latifa. Latifa, you're in Uganda. Is that right? Yes. Amazing. Um, my name is Nasubu Galide Latifa, a girl advocate from Uganda. And right about now, I'm a climate activist. I'm 17 years old. I go to Nyinga High School and I'm proud to be a girl advocate, advocating for investing in girl child education was educating a girl is educating a nation. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And let's say hello to Rita. Hi, Rita. Hi, I am Namandari Tabait from Uganda, 18 years old. I go to Myanga High School. I'm a girl advocate, advocating for child marriage. And right now I'm advocating for climate change. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks, Rita. And then we have Sarah from California. Hi, Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I am a 19-year-old uh, advocate based in Southern California, and I'm also from Kenya. Um, and I have been a part of Air Star Oceans for about three years now since I joined uh, in our yearly Summit for Empowerment Action and Leadership, also known as SEAL. Amazing. We can't wait to learn from all three of you. I know Brooke and I have so much to learn. Brooke, is there anything that you wanted to say as we start? Any reason why this episode is particularly important to you? Yes, and i just like to say hi. I'm so excited to hear you guys speak today. And we had a talk with Dr. Lori Marino yesterday about whale brains, and she recommended you guys so highly. I am looking forward to hearing you guys speak, and I just really 
really hope the connection doesn't break up. And today I was just really curious about what what issues are happening on your side of the world because most people don't really like don't really know because they don't ask. So they just assume everybody else is the same as them. Thank you so much, Brooke. We're we're so excited. So I think without further ado, we're going to turn it over to the youth leaders from Airs to Our Oceans. So Latifa, Rita, and Sarah, we're so excited, excited for your presentation. Take it away. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce a little bit about Airs to Our Oceans now. So uh, as I was saying earlier, I have been a part of Airs for three years since I joined in 2018 at our summit for impaction, uh, for uh, education, action, and leadership, also known as SEAL in 2018. Due to the current COVID pandemic, our SEAL this year was online. Uh, SEAL 2020 brought together a group of nine young, uh, nine youth from nine countries uh, so that we could uh, learn education uh, through each other. And we practice our three our four heirs pillars. Uh, our heirs pillars include real world action based leadership uh, that includes going out into the world and working with uh, people, developing an, a generation of empathetic leaders, empowerment uh, opportunities for all youth, no matter what country they come from, what their religious beliefs are, or what their ethnicities are. We practice youth inspiring youth. We want youth leaders to help and inspire each other. Um, and due to what's been going on in the world recently, we have put uh, a focus on eco, the importance of eco justice. Um, for us to be able to empower all youth, we know that we have to focus on what is going on behind the scenes and intersectionality. We have to address issues such as racism, sexism, and xenophobia, and realize how issues such as that impact our economic status, which impact the resources we have, which means that our communities can be affected more by climate change. One of these issues is food insecurity in low income uh, Black, Indigenous, and POC communities. POC also stands for people of color. So you might be wondering what food insecurity looks like in the United States. Well, that looks like a food desert. And what is a food desert? What does a food desert look like? Well, they look like, they look, food deserts look different in every place, but in California, which is one of the most expensive uh, countries in the expensive states in the United States, food deserts look like McDonald's, 7-Eleven liquor stores, and um, gas station markets, like this picture up on the screen right now. A food desert uh, looking like this means that people, communities, uh, people in the community don't have access to grocery stores, meaning they only get their food from fast food stores or liquor stores or gas station markets, meaning residents of that community don't have access to healthy, plastic-free or sustainable food. And this is what is known as a food desert in the United States. These communities often are low income and um, in the United States, 13.5 million people and 46% of these are low income people um, live in a food desert. Even if people in the community are able to drive out to other cities to have access to food, fresher food is generally more expensive. It doesn't stay as fresh for as long, and it takes a lot more time and resources to cook. This also means that a lot of people who are on benefits can't get fresh food because it tends to be more expensive or not covered. The, um, this is a map of my community in Southern California, San Diego. 
San Diego is a border city. It borders Tijuana, Mexico, and the California uh, um, U.S. border, which means we have a big population of Black and Latinx uh, communities in Southern California. Uh, and a lot of those, as you can see in the orange and in the green, are food deserts. When it comes to fixing food deserts, we have to think about what is going to impact the community the most. So some of the most important solutions to fixing food deserts is urban farming, community gardens, and farmer's markets. Urban farming is any farming project in an urban setting where crops are grown for an economic value to be sold to either a farmer's market or another um, grocery, bigger grocery store. Urban farms are great for communities because not only do they bring produce, but they bring economic freedom and uh, jobs to the community. Community gardens, while similar, are a little bit different. They are maintained for the community, by the community, meaning that the community members who are part of a community garden get access to fresh produce for an even lower price or sometimes free. And both of these coming together to go to farmer's markets means that this brings fresh food and produce to the community at large, especially when counties such as LA County have started saying farmer's markets must, um, must accept benefits so that all people, no matter how much they make or what community they have from, can have access to healthy, fresh, and sustainable food. While these solutions work a lot in California and other places in the US, where food deserts look like what I showed you, gas stations, 7-Elevens, and they look different in other countries and other situations. Rita and Latifah, who were also a part of our SEAL 2020 program, are now going to talk about what food insecurity looks like in their communities and the solutions that they can use to help out. We in Uganda experience a food desert. And where I am from, it's different from what Sarah's community experiences in the States. When I was 13 years of age, I was to be married off. Oh, no. Due to the lack of food, because my family was nearly starving, the climate crisis is causing unpredictable seasons. Farmers cannot predict when to plant or when to harvest, and this is causing food issue. In my family, it nearly forced me into marriage. It being a fact that I'm the only girl and I happen to be the last born. The price of the bride would help sustain my family for some little time. This is not what I wanted. This is not the future that I dreamt of. I don't think that you would want it for your daughter or your granddaughter. I am a female who is human. And this is not the future I imagine to have, nor I imagine for my children. But sad enough, this is my reality. So this has caused me to think, think so hard about what causes pollution. That brings about uh, climate change, which causes food insecurity, hence leading to hunger and starvation. Storing of these products that emit gases into the atmosphere, which bring about a greenhouse effect to our blue planet and even contribute to the climate crisis, hence resulting into effects such as food insecurity that cause hunger and starvation to our families and our people. So I came up with a solution and that is the Climate Smart Urban Farming Project. I grow food and plants to sequester more carbon and as you can see, This is some of the photos that are showing the project 
that I'm talking about and how I do it at my home. There you can see man-made non-biodegradable materials, recycling them and planting in plants, for example, cutters, stacks, metallic tins, and all sorts of plastics. The food I grow, I, I sell it out. So I has to get money to invest in my education, to invest in the education of other girls and that of my siblings. Still, I'm also involved in a climate smart urban farming project at my school, and that is Nyinga High School, alongside with my friend and peer, Rita. Hello, I'm Rita, also from Uganda. I attend school with Latifa. In 2013, we started Climate Smart Urban Farming project at our school. Climate Smart Urban Farming is not affected by any weather condition. And we use industrial materials collected during cleanups so, so that they are no longer littering our natural environment, nor being dumped in the dustbin or landfill. After learning about Climate Smart Urban Farming at our school, I was able to start this project at home and I am successful. Why I did take Climate Smart Urban Farming at my home in my community? Because of the poverty that was killing us. I had to start Climate Smart Urban Farming at my home because I was nearly being married off at 15 years of age to bring in money for the food, for, to bring in money at home to buy food. The food deserts, poverty in Uganda, result in two children, children like yours. No, no parent, no mother, or no any person who love to see their kids being married off at an early age their future being destroyed and threatened, or their childhood. Climate Smart Urban Farming saved me from being married off as a child because I would grow food and sell it to the family to bring in money. Climate Smart Urban Farming works. These are the tomatoes that I grew at home, which helped my family. Climate Smart Urban Farming is the only solution to poverty and crops failing because of the climate crisis. Honestly, starting up this project has not been easy. It being a fact that I am a girl and I have to teach elders, I have to teach men to whom this has been seen as an insult because we girls are not allowed to speak a thing when men are speaking, no. We are not even allowed to make decisions for anyone, not even my own self. But I had to insist on, for my own sake, and the sake of other girls that are looking at me has their voice. So I had to fight so hard to produce positive results that they would help me convince those from my community not to condemn me because I am a girl, no. Not to deny me an education, no, 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 no. And not to force me into marriage at a young age, but rather to support me as I fight for my life. And I grow, I use it to feed my family, and the benefits that come out of it, invest in our education, we as the girls. At first, it wasn't easy for me because I am a young girl that no one wanted to listen to. They thought I was wasting their time. Then people started coming and loved what I used to teach to the community. And then I had to reach to the chairman. And I spoke to the chairman. I told him the advantages of climate smart urban farming. 
And I told him climate smart urban farming is serving a lot of problems like an education, child marriage, and poverty. He went ahead and spoke to them, to the people that weren't listening to me. And they decided to give me an ear and they decided to learn. And they saw the importance of educating a girl, the importance of educating a girl in a community. Other challenges we face while carrying out climate smart urban farming include language barriers. In African countries, there are many different trades and languages. In Uganda, along 45 trades and 45 languages. Also, ignorance is a challenge. A lot of people do not know the benefits of climate smart urban farming, but when they get to know about them, then they are willing to learn. Still, community is seeing this has that work. It being a fact that we are using abandoned items in the community. For example, old car tires, old sacks, all sorts of plastic polluters and metallic tins. So the community sees this has that work. So we will have a job to do, and that is to change the mindset of the community. Still, many people think that farming has to be carried out on a large piece of land, of which it's not true. So we are here to prove them wrong, that with even the literacy of space, you can still carry out farming and bring about the green environment. Still, we the females, we are ashamed from society by the men. Since they have it in them that we the ladies and the women have to always be in the kitchen, have to look after children, so they don't allow us to do farming. And to the few of us who decide to do farming, being a fact that we attend to these gardens, that act has a source of income to the families. So a man then sees that a woman is trying to take up my leadership role in the family and becoming the head of the family, which is not true. So we women in the end are given little time to attend to the farms, it being a fact that we are ever having to look after children, doing all sorts of housework chores among which is cooking. Also, a challenge to start to starting climate smart urban farming is a slow adoption of the project. Many people have office jobs, so getting them to start gardening is, is so difficult for them. Every challenge has a benefit, and there are many to climate smart urban farming. Since it has benefited individuals, it has benefited communities, and even the entire nation at large. In fact, Climate smart urban farming is working towards achieving almost all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, only leaving out one, that is goal number seven, which talks of affordable and clean energy, but the rest all are catered for. For example, no poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, uh, decent work for all, industrialization and innovation, climate action, life below water, partnership for all the goals, among others. Here are some of the benefits of climate smart urban farming. One, climate action. We are reducing on the manufacturing of more man-made materials, hence reducing on industrial emission. Still, we are having plants sequestering carbon dioxide, hence reducing greenhouse gravity. Why? Because we are growing a lot of food. Still, number three, land and water pollution is reduced because we are reusing waste such as plastic, metals, and even the non-biodegradable materials. Still, number four, we are having air pollution, has an air pollution sorted out. How? We are reducing on industrial emissions by reusing what is already in existence. Still, we are having economic empowerment. How? We are fighting poverty at homes for individuals and communities. Still, we are freeing a lot of girls 
from child marriages and moreover forced child marriages. Still, we are supporting girls' education and we can invest in girls' education. Lastly, we are promoting the green environment for the future generation. We all need a, a healthy planet for the future generation to also sustain their lives on it. And indeed, climate smart urban farming is helping us achieve that. For me personally, this project has benefited me because one, we now have food at, at home. Therefore, I'm not worried that I'll be married off at any time to bring in food for the family. Two, we make money from the project. And three, I can now go to school. For me personally, Climate Smart Urban Farming has benefited me in a way that right about now, I grow food that me and my family feed on, so we are fighting food insecurities that would have forced me into marriage. Wow. Still, right about now, I can educate myself, my fellow girls, and even my siblings because I'm able to sell the food that I grow and get money that acts as my school fees or my tuition. Still, Right about now, I can employ people to tend to these farms in my uh, And they also get to test the benefits of climate smart urban farming. Nevertheless, I'm no longer I'm generating source for my family, and that is the climate smart urban farming project, from which they can get the money and even grow food, so I'll not be disturbed to go into marriages that I don't want. Right about now, I'm an economically independent and empowered girl. This has shown my community and my family that even us girls, us girls, can do everything that a boy child can do. And educating a girl is indeed educating a nation. Please, and please, and please, everyone can start Climate Smart Urban Farming Project. Anywhere, anyone can do what we have done. Dear youth listeners, we can help the situation we are in. We can do climate smart urban farming and teach others to do it. You can see here I am, here we are presenting to another school about climate smart urban farming, inspiring more youth to grow food and take control of their futures. Dear adult listeners, we can help sustain our children and even our grandchildren's lives as though they are to inherit our blue planet. It does not take a lot to start up this project. All it takes is one, assuring that you use every sort of non-biodegradable material, every sort of polluting material that is littering in your natural environment to bring about that green environment that many are yearning for, that many are looking for. And how? By using these plastics to bring about the green environment, bringing them back to more use. The car tires, the sacks, the metallic tins that are polluting the environment. Rather, why don't we use them to bring about that green environment? And all that will be able be because of climate smart urban farming. Number two, know what you're fighting for. Just like me, I knew what I was fighting for. That helped me achieve a lot. For example, I knew that I was fighting to stop my unwanted marriage. Number two, I knew that I had to fight for my education, and not only for me, but even for the education of my other fellow girls that are looking up to me. Maybe to you it may be different that you are fighting for climate action and even climate justice. So don't worry about that. That is already in place by us because we are climate activists fighting for climate justice. So the number three of it all and the most important that is having love for what you are doing. Because I believe that everything that is done out of love, everything that is done with love, comes out perfect and victorious. So we did this project with a lot of love and ensured that it comes out victorious for it to encourage other people to join us. A reminder, please remember this. 
educating a girl is educating a nation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the platform that you have given to me and my peer friend, Rita. I remain Nasub Galide Latifa. Educating a girl is educating a nation. Please ensure that you create that green environment. If you don't have it, create it. Climate smart urban farming is the way to go to fight climate change and bring about climate justice. Thank you so much. Wow, Latifa, thank you. Thank you so much, Rita, Sarah, thank you so much, all three of you. I, I learned a lot. I have some questions. I think I might be frozen. Um, can you guys see me okay? You're good. Yeah. yeah, okay. The picture I have of myself is of my arm sticking out weird. So I'll just move on from that. Thanks, Dan, I'm fine. All right. Um, I was, I have so many questions. Are you guys able to stick around and answer a couple questions? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So how, what is the first step for those of us around the world that want to start climate smart urban farming? What is the first step? What do we need to do to replicate the kind of success that you have had? Um. I can go um, for the that. The first step would be. Okay. Rita, should Kifa, you answer what you answer? go. You answer. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, the first step should be, first of all, have love for what you are going to do. And after developing the love, ensure that you collect all sorts of plastics that are littering your natural environment. Then after that, if you want to start planting into the items that you have collected, after getting soil, after filling it in, ensure that you mix in manure from your composite pit. And your composite pit, you can make manure in a way that you put in your kitchen remains, the food that has remained just pour it in. Uh, the drinks that have remained, just pour them in. Then give it a week. Then after that, mix it with the soil that you're going to plant in. After that, still give it one day. Then in the next day, you plant your seedlings in and ensure that you water both in the evening and the morning hours. Then you will be benefiting just like how we have been benefiting. And to add on Latifah's, you know what she has said? When you get the plastics, of course, you have to make a hole where the plant has to be passing through. You can't just put soil when you have not put holes where it will be exchanging air with the soil. So you have to put small holes into the plastics where water will have to pass. Let me say, because you have to pour water and keep on exchanging water in the morning and evening. So when you get the plastics, you have to cut them and put a place where you're going to put the soil. But down, you have to put holes. Yeah. Okay, for for drainage so that the water can drain. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I know I've been doing something wrong. I was gonna ask you, what were some of the mistakes that you made early on? Because I can't believe that every, every plant, every crop would have been grown successfully. So what were some of your biggest mistakes that you made when you got started with your project? Um. Mm. For me personally, I think the first time I did, because like when it's in 2017, when I started this project here at home, like the first mistake I did, I used to water morning, evening, and during the afternoon. And in not doing the afternoon, the sunshine is too much. So when you water, the soil is warm. So this water just burns the roots and, you know, the crops just die. So after a week, I'm waiting for the crops to, you know, to rise up. <laughs> Nothing's going. I'm like, so what's wrong? So when I had to ask uh, back at school to my teacher, they say that you only have to water in the morning and evening. And the other, the other challenge I found is that here at home, we have hens. So when you plant, the, when you do your nursery beds, then you put the seedlings in, the hens come and eat. 
the seedlings. So let me say that, let me say if you planted 100 seeds in the nursery bed, you get like 30 because the, the, the rest were eaten by what? By the hens. Yeah. Mm. And for me, the first mistake that I made was, and that I will never do again, that was to use this chemical manure. Oh. Little did I know that my crops would start wilting. So when I saw that the first time that I used the chemical manure, my crops wilted, then died, I just knew that I have to turn to organic manure. So that's where I got the idea of composting getting the remained food from my kitchen, keep it, let it rot, then mix it with the soil. Then I'll be getting good manure that is helping me to produce a lot of crops with good health and even a lot of production. So that is the mistake that I learned and I'll never try to do again. Yeah. Yes, let us all learn from that mistake. <laughs> Sarah, did you want to add anything? Have you had any experience with, with urban farming? Uh, yes, so in my uh, neighborhood, we have a community garden uh, that we started uh, about a year ago. Um, and so I have a little bit ex of experience with that. I think the biggest mistake that we had did, we did was not giving the crops enough space because we had mm -hmm a limited amount of space to work with. We didn't, uh, we planted too much the first time around and because there wasn't enough sp space for all the roots to grow, uh, some of the crops didn't end up growing. Um, so I think that was the biggest mistake we made the first time around. So the second time around we learned uh, and we, we spread them out more and we expanded the garden. Great. Yeah. And um, Rita and Latifa, how have you been able to teach others? I know you're teaching us right now um, through this amazing episode and you're going to reach so many people around the world. Um, how do you teach people in your community how to make their urban gardens like yours? Are people coming to you and wanting your help and, and what's the what's the program or the steps to actually helping others get this started how have you been able to support your community um okay um, for me first of all me... okay first of all <laughs> at home because now i'm doing it two way both at home and at school at home yeah. i assured that i started it up then I showed that people would admire. So those that would admire would come and say, Latifa, how have you done this? So I was collecting bottles. So they would also start collecting bottles. I would make a compost pit and they also started making a compost pit. I would fill my soil, then mix it with manure and then plant, then create holes. They did the same. So for the issue of school, at school we have done it and it's really so beautiful. So very many people would like to learn from us. So we hold exhibition days. So in those exhibition days, we host a lot of schools that come and we teach okay. them. Just like how you have been seeing in the slides, we have been hosting a lot of people that we have been teaching. And if they can't make it to our school where we are having a demonstration garden, then we offer service, educational services to those people that are interested. We can go to your school and then teach you. If you want it at your home still, we can also come at your home and then do it for you. So we do it practically with you when you are seeing, then we leave you a, with a beautiful compound. So that's how we have been teaching the people that have wanted to know and have admired our gardens. Amazing. Okay. And then for me, I'll add a little. Like in 2017, of course, I had to start by teaching my family because they're around my home. There are only trees and flowers around the garden. So when I learned about it at school, so I had to start it at home because Poverty was really giving us. So we, I had to teach the people at my home. 
we are over like let me say 10 and these 10 people help me to teach other people in the community let me say if today we decide to go in, in the same community everyone takes a different home so we teach different people at a different at, at the same time but different you know different people i take a home this and also takes a home and even at school we are all in a, the agriculture club and we are both leaders so like doing let me say we have timetables if it's agriculture we teach kids how to do it we teach students even like latifa said we host big schools we do exhibitions like this year but because of the pandemic that happened we're going to host mm -hmm. all schools in uganda at our school Myanga high school because our school was the best in agriculture so we lost that chance because of the pandemic yeah so that's how we do it through the exhibitions and the you know the one you teach also goes and teach like other three people yeah as a teacher i'm making so many connections and parallels to what you're saying because when we teach students or even when we teach other teachers it's such a similar process you know it's you start with your example and like you said admiring people admire and they want to do the same then you bring people together and teach them in big groups and then you go out and you coach them and, and provide follow-up support and so the education work that you're doing is is really so similar to, to what to what we do in teaching and learning so it's just it's just amazing um brooke did you have any questions for the girls oh yes i did and i heard you said in the beginning your family wasn't too supportive of the community farming idea and um and a lot of people thought it was dirty work so is like people in your community and your family a little bit more supportive now yeah the people in my community are right about now supportive and they are no longer calling it that work because right now this period of the pandemic has really helped me teach them that farming is not at all that work. It being a fact that these people are no longer depending on their monthly salaries. They are locked down at home. So they see that this urban farming is the only way that they can get food. So they have now decided to become dirty, like how they used to call it dirty work. They have now decided to become dirty and they are getting food. So now that has helped me change their mentality and they have again become more supportive because they have also started seeing the benefits of what they used to call dirty work. Yeah, so that is how people have changed their minds and they are now supporting me because they have at least started benefiting and even seeing the benefits of this farming. Mm -hmm. And then for me, in my community, like I told you at first, they thought I was just in that time. But you know, here in Uganda, in this pandemic, we have a lot of slums people are dying because they're starving they don't have food right now but those that started with me in 2017 today is 2020 are really you know they're not starving they're really seeing the importance of urban farming they even come at home and they're like latif and rita in different communities we are in have like you helped us they thank us because right now they no longer buy you know food because they're planting it at at their homes like now i can give an example like here here at home where we are like i told you we are 10. i planted bananas i planted tomatoes i planted cassava so there, there is no way that we are serving in this pandemic because all the food i need is at home so the people that thought i was wasting that time now they're seeing the importance of time smart urban farming and solving the problem of poverty have the men changed their opinion have you seen the men in the community also changing their opinion about what you're doing yeah yes. but now the men they have are. really changed the, their mindset they are no longer saying that ladies your work has to be in the kitchen because before men would go to the offices and they would be the breadwinners at home but during this period of lockdown they are no longer going to work they are no longer earning salaries so now they are saying that indeed even women should be given a chance to be leaders and breadwinners at home through climate smart urban farming so in that process they are also starting to work hand in hand with the women to go together in the garden and then get food and even get a source of income so that is even bringing about unity in the family and more respect to the ladies yeah girl power 
I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> I think it's so important too that our audience understands that climate smart urban farming, it's not just about changing the environment, that it transforms communities and changes lives. And I think that that's really what you've taught us today. Thank you. And it also promotes unity. <laughs> Absolutely. Any, any last thoughts for the audience? Um, from Sarah, Rita, or Latifa, or Brooke, any last um, words of wisdom to give our young audience to empower them? Um, I Maybe. think I'll go first, then Sarah, then Tifa. Is it fine, Sarah? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. To me, I have a saying that says, and it's my motto, never give up. I know we are all in the pandemic and we are receiving different problems. But climate smart urban farming is the only way to go. Start small, think big. The small piece of land that you have is enough for you to do climate smart urban farming. Even those plastics, you can hand them on the windows as you grow your plants. And let's keep our environment green and protect the nature that we have because nature needs us and we need nature, but it does not need us. So let's keep the environment green. And don't forget, like our saying is, educate a girl and educate a nation. Thank you so much. Um, I just think you guys are all examples. And like you guys are really good role models. And this also shows that young people can be leaders and make change because it seems that what so that you guys have gone through a lot of trouble to change how people like women are thought of in your in your um in your families and communities and i i just completely blown away and thank you so much for being here today and for calling in from far away places like uganda and then um california <laughs> Um, I thank you so much that thank you so much you've taught me so much and thank you Brooke um, how about let's see Sarah did you have any last words of wisdom for us yeah uh, the only thing I would say is that if you see a problem in the community and you think that it's too big for you to change it it, it never is too big. Uh, so many movements in history have been started by young people seeing a problem and coming together to change it. The women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, and the, a lot of the movements we see right now, the climate change movement and Black Lives Matter, it all was started by young people coming together and seeing a problem in their community and saying, this isn't too big for us, we can make a difference. So. I think the most important thing to remember is that the most important change happens when you put your mind to it and you believe that you can do it and you come together as a community of people. <laughs> uh, Very well said. Thank what you. I have for the world out there is that change starts with you. I brought about change. I brought a solution to my family. I was to be married off. Imagine at 13 years old. But I was like, I have to fight this reality of mine. So if my problem was food insecurity, I had to come up with a solution and that was climate smart urban farming. Right now I'm economically independent. I'm a strong girl advocate, most of for girl child education. But all began when I decided to take up the responsibility of becoming a solution creator. I did not have to wait for a problem. So to all the girls out there, because I can see all of us inside this room are ladies. We should stand out. We should become what is said of us. If the saying is, educating a girl is educating a nation, let's prove them right, that we girls are the solutions to this world. And if we are educated, then we can do better. The solution is within you because you have the power to do it. Mm -hmm. Change starts with me and you because I'm the change and you are the change. 
I'll forever remain Latifa, a girl advocate, most so for girl child education, with my saying has always that educating a girl is educating a nation. Girl power, we are the solution of this world. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect place to end today. Um, to our audience, you can follow Airs to Our Oceans on Instagram at Airs to Our Oceans and on Facebook at the same handle at Airs to Our Oceans. And um, ladies, do you have a, a way that we can kind of track your progress or is there any, I mean, we can, we can cut this out if we don't want to keep this in there, but is there anything that, um, any way for our audience to, to keep up with what you're doing? I think we can all be gotten to through hairs to our ocean. Perfect. And with the Ugandan team, we can be gotten to through Miss Harriet Kamashanyu, who works in an organization called Rhythm of Life. It's also a girl empowering organization. So that's how you can get us Ugandan girls. And to get Excellent. us globally, that is through hairs to our ocean. Perfect. We'll make sure that we have that information up on the episode uh, for our audience. So thank you. Okay. All right. So environmental change maker audience, please uh, tune back in tomorrow. We will have a second episode with Airs to Our Ocean, which is so, so exciting. And um, you can see us all the rest of the week at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Thank you so much. It was lovely to meet all of you. Thank, Thank you, you for, for inspiring us. us. Thank, you. Thank you for teaching us. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Bye.